Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 304, The Absolute Basics of the Christian Faith. This episode of the Trinity's podcast was initiated by some listener feedback, and I'm not sure if this person wants me to use their name or not, so I'm going to not name them, but they wrote me an email that said, Our church is starting its annual confirmation classes and is using a new curriculum from Seedbed. Any chance you could possibly provide some feedback on this, either as part of your blog or otherwise? Yes, I can, and that's what I'm going to do in this episode. I'm going to play three of these videos and comment on them as we go along. I wrote back and asked what sort of church this was, and the answer comes back that it's a United Methodist Church. It says there are a lot of good things about the church, the fellowship is good, and there's otherwise sound and thoughtful teaching, but that they're pretty conventional when it comes to Trinitarian dogma. They don't emphasize it, but they write, the Trinity and Jesus as God Those are always an overwhelming concentration in most confirmation curricula. They'll spend three to four weeks on that sort of thing and then barely discuss things like lordship, kingdom, focus, or spiritual growth and devotion, etc. So I looked at the Seedbed YouTube channel, and it's basically a Wesleyan operation. So Protestants that are not Calvinist, that are anti-Calvinist in their orientation, in general, Bible-focused and holiness-focused growing in grace and sinning less and less as one goes on, not viewing sanctification merely as a legal transaction or merely in a change in how God views you, but an actual change from sinning more to sinning less as one's Christian life goes on. So there are a lot of things to like about the Wesleyan tradition and even about John Wesley himself. However, John Wesley himself was not interested in challenging traditional small-c Catholic views about the Trinity or Incarnation, so he did kind of just pass along that part of the tradition. Basically, I'm in sympathy with what they're trying to do. They're trying to take standard Christian teaching and make it simple enough to be understood by the ordinary person. However, in the process of doing that, they're bringing along so much small-c Catholic baggage that they can't help but say a whole bunch of wildly controversial things. Say, well, look, this is just what Christianity says. And uh, there's a lot of problems with that, as I'll discuss. So as we go along, I will try to keep things easily understandable by the average layperson. And as we go along, I'm going to point you to other Trinities podcasts that will go into more depth about some of these deep and difficult topics that are being very quickly brushed over. So accompanying the narration in these videos, there's a left-handed guy drawing neat little pictures with a marker, kind of illustrating what's being said. So it's cool, it's well done, but I won't probably comment too much on the visual aspect of it. So here we go. This video is called, Who is God? God is Trinity. The Trinity is one of the most important theological ideas ever, but it gives people panic attacks when they think about it. Yep. So this chapter will give you the building blocks you need to understand what the Trinity is and why it matters so much. Okay. God is three persons who have existed for all eternity, are all equally powerful, wise, and good, and have always depended on each other. There's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit existing in perfect harmony as one God. So how can this be? How can you have three things that exist perfectly together as one? I like the pictures here. There's a little guy who's just about tearing his hair out of his head, and there are question marks all over the page, right? How can you have three different beings all be the same God? Well, here's the thing. If you can understand a tiny bit about how music works, Uh you can understand the basics of the Trinity. So find a piano, pick any white key, and put your thumb on it, then skip a white key and put your index finger on the next one, then skip one more and put your middle finger on the next white key. Now press down your thumb, index finger, and middle finger, and boom. There's a harmonic chord. Three distinct sounds, all existing in a perfect harmony. Three things that are also one thing. The threeness and the oneness work perfectly together. This gives us a picture, rather a sound, of what God is like. There is one God, like the one chord, with three persons, like the three notes, all existing in perfect harmony forever. So already you know we're off to some very contentious claims here, 
a lot of Trinitarians would tell you straight up that this is a terrible analogy for the Trinity. And a lot would go even farther and say that there aren't any good analogies for the Trinity, so you just shouldn't give analogies at all. This idea that playing a three-note chord shows you how there can be three things that are one thing. No, the three things are not one thing, right? If you're playing a C, an E, and a G, and then you have that whole chord, the note C is not the whole chord. What that's an illustration of is something with three parts. So what's wrong with that? Can you say that the persons of the Trinity are three parts of God? Honestly, it depends on the Trinitarian. A few Trinitarians, like William Lane Craig and William Hasker, uh, Richard Swinburne, basically seem to say or imply that the persons of the Trinity, yep, are three parts of God. If you go back in the classical tradition, number one, you're not going to find anybody offering this analogy for the Trinity. This is a very modern, recent kind of idea to compare the Trinity to a chord of three notes, I think. And you're going to meet people who insist that the one God, indeed the triune God, has to be absolutely simple, which is to say without parts of any kind. So traditional Roman Catholic Trinitarians who agree with this doctrine of divine simplicity will vehemently deny that the persons of the Trinity are three parts of God. The people who are willing to talk about the persons of the Trinity as parts of God generally are what's in recent times called social Trinitarians. And this is a recent phenomenon of about the last 50 years. They emphasize that, quote, the persons of the Trinity really are three different selves. They are intelligent beings who have interpersonal relationships with one another. And I think a main motivation for this type of Trinity theory is just the fact that you see an interpersonal relationship in the New Testament between the Father and the Son. If it's really an interpersonal relationship, and not one being kind of play-acting with himself, then they have to be two different selves. right? And then if you've interpreted the first two persons of the Trinity as selves, it's natural to say the Holy Spirit is a third person. So this whole presentation is very what others call social Trinitarian. I would call it a three-self Trinity theory. And it's really opposed to a lot of other elements in Trinitarian tradition. It's a very specific type of Trinity theory that really has only become popular recently. The two most famous and important Trinitarian theologians of the 20th century were the Reformed theologian Karl Barth, spelled Barth, and the Roman Catholic theologian Karl Rahner. And both of them were very against this sort of three-self account of the Trinity. They basically thought that God is a single self and that we talk about three persons in tradition, but we shouldn't think that those persons are selves. They're really just something like ways God is or ways God lives or something like that. So really then God is a single he, a single him on their view. You see a philosophical articulation of this type of view in the work of present-day Oxford philosopher Dr. Brian Leftow. So anyway, what's being presented as the Christian view of the Trinity here is a very particular kind of Trinity theory. It's a three-self theory or a social Trinitarian theory. And the analogy that's been given is a very contentious one. Many Trinitarians would reject it. It's not a part of the old tradition, really. It's a very recent kind of thing. So let's let him continue. So unlike the chord, which we just played, which came into being, then ceased to exist, the three persons of the Trinity have always existed. They've always existed in the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father has always been Father to the Son. He can't be a Father without a Son. The Son has always been Son to the Father, and they've always been unified by the love of the Spirit. So that is part of the classical tradition that goes back to the 300s. The three persons of the Trinity all have to be eternal, and they all have to be eternally divine. Whether the Spirit is the love that unites the Father and Son, that's a little Augustinian sort of uh, riff, but I don't think that's an important part of the theology that's being presented here. What this means is the most basic fact of all reality is loving relationship. Nope. That's not, <laughs> believe it or not, that's another super contentious claim that there's a basic fact uh, in reality, which is this interpersonal relationship between these three divine beings. 
It's part of the classical tradition. Again, going back to before there were Trinity theories, there was speculation about the pre-human Jesus or the Logos. At first, they held the view that uh, when it was time to create, God brought into existence this word, this second divine person, so that God could create through this lesser divine being. As time went on, and particularly you see this in the work of Origen, they held the view that just eternally God gives existence to this Logos, to this second divine being. So this is what in, is in traditional Trinitarian uh, theology called a doctrine of processions. So the Father eternally generates the Logos or the pre-human Jesus, and then the Father and the Son, according to Roman Catholics, give existence to the Spirit, where the Spirit proceeds, they say, from the Father and the Son, or in Eastern Orthodox theology, just the Father alone gives existence to the Spirit. So there are three things in the theory. The foundational fact is that is not that there are these three things existing in loving relationship. If you accept this doctrine of processions, the basic foundational fact is that the Father exists. And then for some reason, eternally, the Father causes the existence of the Son and then also of the Spirit. Whether or not he's cooperating with the Son, never mind that. So we've just skipped over the fact that two of these three divine persons exist because of another, which would seem to conflict with their being fully divine. Okay, but there are some Protestants in modern times. This is going back to about the early 1800s or round about there. They have said these traditional speculations about God eternally generating the Son and the Father and the Son eternally uh, spirating the Spirit or causing the Spirit to exist, these are without any biblical foundation. And moreover, they make two of the three persons of the Trinity exist because of something else, which seems to rule out perfect, full, absolute divinity. So some Protestants just deny this central element of the old small c Catholic tradition. They deny that there is any biblical doctrine of processions. They say that's merely human speculation that arose after the times of the New Testament. Now, the guy in the video, he just is going to skip processions entirely. So maybe he agrees with these scholars that the Bible actually doesn't teach anything about eternal generation and spiration. But he's just, he's passing that over. Okay, suppose that eternal generation and spiration are all just mistaken. Okay, then just in eternity, you have these three divine persons. Let's let him keep going. Before there was a world, there was a family. The family. Family. The God. Oh. So when you get down to the very bottom of things, to the root of all reality, there's love. Okay, wow. So notice that the one God has just been said to be a family. Again, this is a very recent social Trinitarian theme. Look at all the talk about God in the Bible. You'll notice that, well, in the Old Testament, God has a proper name, Yahweh, which seems to be as proper a name as John or Martha or Mary or Phil. Right, And that goes hand in hand with the assumption that God is a single self, not a group of selves, which is what a family is. Okay, but he's interpreting the persons of the Trinity as three selves, and now he's characterizing the whole Trinity as a family, which would preclude the one God, the Trinity, from being a self. In fact, it looks like it would preclude the Trinity from being a God, right? Because a God shouldn't just be a group of things. Okay, but then after saying this incredibly contentious thing, that the one God is analogous to a family, so that ultimately just there's three beings there that exist in relationship and not one tripersonal being, then he immediately launches into this theme of love. So when you get down to the very bottom of things, to the root of all reality, there's love. C.S. Lewis makes this interesting point in Mere Christianity. He writes, All sorts of people are fond of repeating the Christian statement that God is love, but they seem not to notice that the words God is love have no real meaning unless God contains at least two persons. Oh boy. Love is something that one person has for another person. Mm. If God was a single person, then before the world was made, he was not love. This part depresses me. The present day evangelical saint C.S. Lewis here is kind of cited as if he's some kind of authority giving some kind of strong argument here. And, uh, 
it's all just riddled with errors. It's fundamentally just poor speculation. It's not true to say that love always involves two selves, two or more selves, because you can love yourself. So there is love that just involves a single person loving himself. Okay, but what about interpersonal love? Why would you think that a Christian has to say that God is interpersonal love? Where does that statement that God is love come from anyway? Well, I'll tell you. It comes from 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7, New Revised Standard. It reads, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, is this saying that the triune God, the Trinity, is love in the sense that included in the definition of the Trinity there is an interpersonal loving relationship? No, it's absolutely not saying that, and this isn't really a point that can be argued. When John writes that God is love, he's talking about the Father, not the Trinity. How do we know this? Well, the Trinity, in the sense of the triune God, this is not mentioned anywhere in Scripture by any word or by any name. And scholars tell us that in the New Testament, when you see the word God, more than 99% of the time, that's referring to the Father. And there's a small handful of cases in which it can be argued that it instead refers to the Son. For more on God terminology in the Bible, I recommend that you check out my podcasts 224 through 226. Links are on the blog post for this episode. So just by general kind of reading comprehension of the New Testament, you know that he's referring to the Father here when he says that God is love. You also know because of the very next verse. So 1 John 4, 9 says, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Who sent the Son? The Father. He is talking about the Father here. Now, is he saying that the Father has within himself a wonderful, loving, interpersonal relationship? Of course not. Is it true, as C.S. Lewis says, that it's meaningless to say that God is love unless within God there is an interpersonal relationship? Of course it's not meaningless. In fact, the meaning is very plain and obvious. When he says that God is love, what he means is that God is loving God has the virtuous character trait of being a loving being or a loving person. It's a superlative way of saying it. Not just that he's loving, but he's like the greatest example of being loving, of having that character trait. So God is the greatest exemplar of lovingness. That's another way to put it. So there's actually no biblical basis for these speculations about God and love. And so to be love, God has to be a trinity. In fact, the first person who ever speculated along these lines was a medieval Roman Catholic philosopher named Richard of St. Victor, who died in the year 1173. So Christianity went along for quite a long time before anybody started arguing that God has to be a trinity because God is love. You'll find a few preachers in the present day saying that Augustine teaches this. No, Augustine does not teach that. I have a forthcoming paper on this that's currently under review at a Philosophy of Religion and Analytic Theology journal, which I hope will actually be published. If it does get published, I'll put a link to it on the blog post for this episode. In that paper, I actually discuss Augustine and why people misread him on this score. Some other Trinities podcasts that deal with this topic include Podcast 58, Why We Can't Prove the Trinity by Reason Alone. Right, That's arguing that if God is perfect in love, therefore God must be a Trinity. Also in 2019, I published a paper on these sorts of arguments, co-authored with a Jewish-Israeli scholar named Dr. Samuel Liebens. That paper is available free online. I'll put a link to it on the blog post for this episode. It's called Dormant Dispositions, Agent Value, and the Trinity. Also, a few years earlier, I published a book chapter on this, which you can find on my academia.edu page. It's called On the Possibility of a Single Perfect Person, 
And again, there I rebut these arguments that if God is perfect in love, then God has to be triune. They're clever arguments. None of them are convincing. And it would be, frankly, not honest to present these sorts of speculative arguments like, this is just part of Christianity. This is what Christians have always said. Again, this type of argument only goes back to the 12th century, not to the 4th century or the 3rd century or the 1st century when the New Testament was written. When the Trinity's podcast returns, more wild speculations presented as basic Christian teaching. Okay, back to the video. So the fact that God is perfectly loving requires that God is relational. Nope. And the opposite is also true. The fact that God is relational requires that God is perfectly loving. And here's why. What? If God is triune, we know that God is love because you can't have three people existing for all eternity in harmonious relationship if they aren't perfectly loving. Imagine existing for all eternity with your brothers and sisters or even your friends. Eventually you get into some fights. But the Father, Son, Holy Spirit they don't fight. We know that God is love because God is a trinity. And we know that God is a trinity because God is love. And guys, to be honest, this is just bad philosophizing. Okay, so he's argued that God has to be tripersonal because God is perfectly loving. So God has to have interpersonal relationships within him or within it to be perfectly loving this argument doesn't work. Even if it did work, it would only get you that there has to be at least two persons in God, right? Because two is the minimum for an interpersonal relationship. How would you get three? Anyway, this is supposedly how we know that God is a trinity because God is love. And then he tries to turn it around and show the opposite, that we know that God is love because God is trinity but what he infers from these three persons eternally existing without fighting is not that God is love, but that the individual persons are love. Like the individual persons have perfect character or something. Honestly, this is just speculative junk. Where does the Bible discuss this eternal perfect relationship between these three divine persons? See if you find that to be a theme anywhere in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Right, and the one passage cited doesn't say anything remotely like this. In fact, it's just talking about the perfection of the Father himself. Again, we can ask, is this Paul's doctrine about the love of God? Romans chapter 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the greatest illustration of God's love is his sending his human son as an atoning sacrifice for us so that we could be eternally reconciled to God. You can think that God is love and you can think that God is perfectly loving without being a Trinitarian of any kind. In fact, that's the view of the New Testament authors. So the Trinity is this perfect loving relationship that's always existed, one God and three persons. The and Trinity is a relationship. The Trinity is one wow. God, the persons work together. It's so the one God is a relationship. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says, We are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The entire Trinity is at work in saving us. So we must name the whole Trinity as we're made part of Christ's body through baptism. Okay, so again, this is the general pattern of this video. You have speculation piled on speculation just pushed at you so fast with the implication that this is just what the scripture obviously teaches. So yeah, there's this triadic formula in Matthew only 
it's an interesting question why it's only in Matthew and why you don't see this type of baptismal formula in Acts. But it mentions being baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And this is interpreted as, you must do this, you must name all three, because each of these three are divine persons that equally well cooperated in your salvation. So naturally, you have to mention this. The idea that the three persons of the Trinity are always united in all their actions regarding the created realm, that is a speculation that started to gain traction in the 300s during the, quote, Arian controversy. It's not obviously true, although it is something which is commonly assumed by Trinitarian theologians as they're speculating. And it's not just baptism. All throughout the story of Jesus, we see all three persons at work. There's a pattern here. The Father is the source of everything, and he sends the Son to the world in the power of the Spirit. We see this in Jesus' power of the Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, the Son of God is born into the world. We see this in Jesus' baptism. The Son carries out the mission of the Father in the power of the Spirit. And we see this in Jesus' blessing his disciples when he ascends. When the Son goes back to the Father, he sends the Spirit to empower us. Did you detect the pattern? Here it is again. The Father is the source and goal of our salvation. Jesus is the way, and the Holy Spirit is the power to get there. Right, so this thing that he's presenting as a pattern of Scripture regarding the work of God, the Son of God, and the Spirit of God, that's a pattern that someone like me can easily accept. It's compatible with being a Unitarian Christian. So, right, where does the idea of a triune God actually come in here? To say that God sends his Son, uh, and that God and his exalted Son now empower us with the Divine Spirit, yeah, that's compatible with a Trinitarian or a Unitarian theology. But I don't think our presenter realizes that. Imagine it a bit like this. The Father is the one who says, let there be light. And the sun goes and flips on the light switch. And the spirit is the electricity that powers the light bulb. The Father is the source, the sun is the way, and the Holy Spirit is the power. Same thing. Another way of thinking about this is compatible with Trinitarian or Unitarian. Praying the Lord's Prayer. We're praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Now imagine Jesus is standing beside you. And so we begin by praying our Father, and immediately we see that Jesus is helping us to have right relationship with his Father. Now also imagine it's the Holy Spirit inside you who's giving you the power to pray the prayer Jesus taught us. The Son beside you, the Father above you, the Spirit inside you, all working to give us right relationship with God. All this might seem a bit mysterious and complicated, but the Mm -hmm. nice thing is that once you start looking for the Trinity, you see it everywhere. For instance, Uh the very words of the Apostles' Creed are shaped by the Trinity. We begin with the Father, the Source, move to the Son, the Way, and end with the Spirit, the Spirit's area of work empowering the Church. The Father above you, Jesus beside you, spirit inside you. There you go. There's the Trinity. So what he's doing in this portion of the presentation is he's moving away from the term Trinity as referring to a triune God, a God in which there are three persons. And he's just switching to, quote, the Trinity as mentioning just God, the Son of God, and the Spirit of God. So he's switching from the idea of a triune God to the idea of a triad, one member of which is God. And uh, yeah, you do see that triad in early creeds like the Apostles' Creed or precursors of the Apostles' Creed, like the baptismal creeds of the 100s. But what you don't see in them is any mention of a triune or tripersonal God. And the reason you don't see that in early creeds or even in the Nicene Creed of 325 is because this idea of a tripersonal God is later You don't see it in Christian history until after the year 350, and really it only becomes prominent after the so-called ecumenical council in the year 381. It's in the wake of that council that now small c Catholic Christians have to confess that there are three persons in one God. So what this presentation isn't telling you is about the Protestant minority report. Since the Reformation, Christians have repeatedly looked carefully at the Bible and discovered that this Catholic tradition of a triune God just actually isn't in the Bible. And even worse than that, what is taught in the New Testament actually conflicts with any Trinity theory, because the explicit and clear New Testament doctrine is that the one true God just is the Father himself. And that's not consistent with the one true God being the Trinity. No matter what the Trinity is, 
And I mean, this eternal interpersonal relationship, this eternal family-like thing, I mean, that's just not the sort of thing that could be the one God, right? It's like a category mistake. It's like, let me introduce you to my son. And my son, I define as my relationship with my wife. It's like, don't you know what a son is? That's not the sort of thing that can be a relationship between a husband and a wife, right? Well, God's not the sort of thing that could just be a relationship between three divine beings. A God is just a divine being, right? That's what divinity is supposed to be. It's, it's Godhood. It's divinity. It's what makes something a God. When the Trinity's podcast returns, the next video in this series, which is entitled, What is God Like? What he's going to expound now is a part of the ancient tradition that derives from the 4th century. This is the claim of the Nicene Creed in 325 that the Father and Son are one usia, one essence. And then in the 381 Creed, it's also assumed that the Spirit is also that same usia, that same essence or nature. So what he's going to explicate now is the idea that these three persons are equally divine in that they have this divine essence. So as we've discussed, God is three persons, Father, Son, So by God, he means the triune God. Three persons in one God. Something not mentioned in the Bible. They're distinct from their personhood, but united in their very nature. Nature is a bit of a hard word, so let me explain that. Nature here means the kind of thing something is. Triangle's nature is to be a closed figure with three sides and three angles. Ice cream's nature is to be a frozen milk product. And giraffe's nature is to be a long-necked, even-toed, ungulate mammal. So what's God's nature? What kind of thing is God? Well, the best way to speak about God's nature is to say that God is, in every way, a perfect kind of thing. God's nature is whatever is best. Perfect being theology, St. Anselm, a medieval monk, describes God as supremely great. God is so great for Anselm that he's the greatest being we can think of. This is what we mean when we say that God is a perfect being. He's referring there to St. Anselm who died in 1109. He was a Roman Catholic bishop and a very sharp philosopher. He does define God as a perfect being in his famous ontological argument. Interestingly, this tradition actually goes back to pre-Christian times. You can find this in publications by Dr. Brian Leftow and others. Uh, It was really a part of Greek philosophy, this idea that to be truly fully divine, the way that the one God is divine, you should be perfect in every way. This type of reasoning that philosophers call perfect being theology has been widely used off and on through Christian history, and it's not something that's only confined to the area of Trinitarian speculation. The difficulty with it is that you might have wonky ideas of perfection, and then by this type of reasoning, you might infer, for instance, that God has to be timeless and couldn't possibly change in any way something which pretty clearly clashes with the biblical portrayals of God. You might infer that God is incapable of being angry, for instance, or being pleased by our actions, again, which seems to conflict with scriptural witness. So you have to be very careful with perfect being theology, but it is a widely employed tool. It's a way of reasoning that can be used both by Trinitarian Christians and by Unitarian Christians. The idea of perfection is important because we are called not only to love God, but also to worship Him. And worship means to offer total devotion. And only a perfect being is truly worthy of worship. Wow. Okay, so now we're being told that only a perfect being, so only God Himself, is worthy of worship. That's not a New Testament teaching, because in the New Testament, you can just observe that God is worshipped and also the risen and exalted human Messiah is worshipped. So there are two who are worshipped, for instance, in Philippians 2 and in Revelation 5. 
So it looks like, according to the New Testament, that it's false that only a perfect being, that is only God, is worthy of worship. Because if God wants us to worship his exalted son, well, we should worship the exalted son. And this is, as Paul says in Philippians 2, to the glory of God the Father. Okay, so we're just sneaking in a very contentious premise here, right? It's not true by definition that only a perfect being is worthy of worship. It's not clear how you could argue based on either scripture or reason for this proposition, but here it is just being set down as just, hey, this is just part of the basic content of Christianity. It's not. If you want to explore this topic more, check out Trinity's podcast 227, Who Should Christians Worship?, or the paper with that same title, which you can find online. I there discuss the actual New Testament teaching on worship and God and Jesus and what he's about to get into right here. Worshiping anything less than a perfect being is sinful. Not according the Bible to the New Testament. Bible has a word for worshiping less than perfect things. It's called idolatry. That's not the biblical this definition is why the of idolatry. Says, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The true God can't be a lesser deity with some powers. Zeus, for instance, from Greek mythology, has a lot of power through lightning bolts, but he didn't create lightning. Zeus isn't even eternal. According to mythological stories, Zeus had a father and came into being at a particular point in time. The only God worthy of worship is perfectly powerful, perfectly wise, good, and exists before everything as the creator of anything that exists. Well, sure, but the only God worthy of worship is also, according to the New Testament, the only God. And this is the Father, not an imagined trinity. One of the ways we know from Scripture that Jesus is the true God is that he's worshipped. No. Nope. After his resurrection, when Jesus meets the women at the tomb, the Bible says the women came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Jesus is worthy of worship because he's the true God, the second person of the trinity. And God is perfect. Okay, if you're going to say that Jesus is the true God... The problem with that is that you're going to go against Jesus' clear teaching in John chapter 17, namely this part right here where he's praying. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In this prayer, as reported by John, Jesus addresses the Father as the only true God. Well, if the Father is the only true God, then there isn't anyone else who is true God. Even his human son. In the New Testament, they worship Jesus even while distinguishing him from God, and nobody in the New Testament, not the narrator, not a character, infers that Jesus is God himself, or that he's a person within a multipersonal God because he's worshipped. Now, in order to understand perfection, we have a little bit of a problem. True perfection is hard to describe because we are not perfect. Imperfect people have a hard time knowing exactly what a perfect being would be like. True. Think about it a little bit like this. We can imagine the idea of a perfect circle, but when we try and draw one, it's very hard. We mess up. Likewise, we can imagine the idea of a perfect God, even if we can't actually describe all the things this perfect God would be like. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the Bible helps us out here by telling us some things about God's perfection. That God's perfection means that God is perfectly powerful, mm -hmm. perfectly knowing, yep. perfectly good. Right. This means... God can do anything, God knows everything, and God will always do what is right. Well, it means more than just God will always do what's right. It means that God is immune from temptation. And right, these very divine attributes show how we know that Jesus is not God himself or that he's not divine in the way that the one God is divine. The Jesus of the New Testament expressly tells us that he does not know everything and that there's something that God knows that he doesn't, which is the day and hour of his return. The New Testament Jesus doesn't seem to be omnipotent, but seems to be empowered by God to do the mighty works that he does. 
The New Testament Jesus always does what's right, yes. However, the New Testament Jesus can be tempted, whereas the New Testament is explicit that God can't be tempted. So, in the sense of perfect goodness, where that implies immunity from temptation, God is perfectly good, but Jesus, in that sense, is not perfectly good. For more on this topic, check out Podcast 277, Was Christ Tempted in Every Way? For us, this is really good news, because this means that we can fully trust God. He knows us completely and loves us perfectly. Nothing, except for us, can stop God from achieving the good plans He has for us. If God weren't perfect in this way, we might not be able to fully trust Him. If God had all the power, but wasn't perfectly wise, He could be kind of destructive. If God was perfectly smart, but wasn't perfectly good, He might become kind of a villain. If God was perfectly good, but didn't have the power to save us, He would be sort of useless. Take this example. Imagine you have three superheroes. Power person, genius guy, and moral man. Power person can do anything, but he's not very smart. So whenever he tries to help, he often does the wrong thing. Genius guy knows everything, but he isn't fully good. So sometimes he helps, looks but like sometimes he uses his brilliance to his own self. Genius chance. guy looks like a mad scientist. Moral man knows exactly what the right thing to do is. Moral man looks like a nice kid with a baseball cap. But he isn't cap. all powerful and all knowing. So even though he wants to help everybody, he can't. He's just a guy. If you got into trouble, which of these three would you call? It's hard to say. None of them might be any help. The good news is, though, that God is power person, genius guy, and moral man, all rolled into one. He has all the power, all the knowledge, and is perfectly good. So we can always trust him. Right. And that he that he's talking about in the New Testament is the Father. God the Father Almighty. And notice what our narrator does. Like any of us, as soon as he's thinking about the divine attributes like omniscience, omnipotence, and omnibenevolence, he's thinking about God as a self, not as a family of selves. And that's indeed how the Bible always portrays the one God. When the Trinity's podcast returns, the third and final video entitled, Who is Jesus Christ? So as we said before, the story of God goes like this. In the beginning, the Trinity was whole and complete, Mm. and then created as a free gift of love. Humans were given real freedom and real responsibility, so they could be real relationship. But instead of responding with thankfulness we owed to God for the gift of life, the universe, and everything, we ungratefully disobeyed. Mm -hmm. And because of our disobedience, our relationship with God was broken, and the punishment that fell on us was death. But God had a plan. Through a series of promises and marvelous works, God recreated a people, Israel, who would know God and have relationship with him. Mm -hmm. The story of the Old Testament is that story. Broken relationship and a broken people are brought back into connection with God. Through the covenants with Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David, God reestablishes connection with humanity so he can have a people that represent him. In his covenant with Abraham, God picks a man through whom he will create a nation. Abraham will have a son and his children will dwell in the promised land. In his covenant with Moses, God picks a man to tell the Israelites how to live as God's people. They will not simply be a nation, but a holy nation. In these covenants, God establishes a people again. He rebuilds a community that will represent and resemble him on earth. Mm -hmm. But God didn't just want to have one people at one place to have connection with him. He wanted all people to have connection with him. Right. This plan is seen way back in God's covenant with Abraham, Mm -hmm. where God promises that through Abraham, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. And so the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to make a permanent connection between God and all of humanity. Now what's glaringly absent in that presentation is any mention of the biblical concept of God's Messiah, 
is Christ, his anointed one. In Deuteronomy, Moses predicts that God will send another prophet like him, and the New Testament says that this is fulfilled in Jesus. Other passages portray the Messiah as a descendant of King David, who will rule forever on David's throne. Of course, a descendant of David is a man. The Christ, or the Jesus of the New Testament, is a man. His mother was Mary, and he was miraculously conceived. Now, the traditional theorizing is that actually the Son of God that's the most important is this eternal divine person, which has always existed within the Trinity, and uh, which had to come down, so to speak, from heaven, uh, become incarnate at a certain point in time. Let's just keep in mind, there's the obvious New Testament Jesus, who is a man, and then there's this eternal divine Son of Catholic theorizing. And we have to start to wonder, wait, how are these two related? Can we believe in both of these sons, or are we going to have to pick one or the other? And actually, Catholic tradition talks about a composite, which is neither the human part alone nor the divine part alone, but that which is made up by both of those. The theorizing here in the tradition gets very difficult and convoluted. If you want an accessible introduction to this, then check out my lecture called Clarifying Catholic Christologies. I'll put a link to that on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. Okay, so next the narrator is going to give us a little speculative argument for this conclusion, that any effective Savior will have to be both human and divine. One of the key images for this connection is given to us in the Old and New Testaments. In Genesis 28.12, Jacob dreams of a ladder that goes from heaven to earth and has angels ascending and descending on it. In John 1.51, Jesus describes himself as that ladder, a ladder that stretches all the way up to the heavens and comes all the way down to the earth. This ladder is perhaps the clearest image for what Jesus did when he became human. If you look at commenters on this text, They derive various inferences from this allusion to the story in Genesis 28. But the basic idea seems to be that Jesus is the way to God, to relationship with God, and to knowledge of God. The word that we use for Jesus coming down to earth is incarnation. Incarnation means taking on flesh. The incarnation, which we read about in the beginning of the Gospels, describes the way that the Son of God, who is a divine spirit, added humanity to who he was. So just keep in mind, incarnation is not a biblical word, and nor is incarnation a clear biblical teaching. But it is read into John 1 and Philippians 2 and a small handful of other passages. I hate to tell you it's an egregious error to say that we see incarnation at the start of the Gospels. The Gospel according to Mark opens up right before the start of Jesus' ministry when he gets baptized. Matthew and Luke tell us about Jesus' miraculous conception. And this not only doesn't mention anything about incarnation, but actually these accounts are incompatible with incarnation because they portray Jesus as begotten, and so coming into existence as a result of God's miraculous action in Mary. The only kernel of truth in what he said is that in the unusual prologue to the fourth gospel, the gospel according to John, it's traditional for Catholics and Protestants to read this as having to do with incarnation. So they think at the start of the passage it says that the pre-human Jesus, called the Word, eternally exists with the Father. And then verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. And they interpret that as, it's not just an eternal divine spirit taking on a flesh, a human body, but they say it's a complete human nature, but it's an anhypostatic human nature. It's a human nature which does not itself constitute a human person rather the eternal divine person, enters into an indescribable union with that thing, the quote, complete human nature, body and soul. And because of that mysterious union, you can call the eternal divine person human. Now that's not what the passage says. However, that is how it's traditionally interpreted by mainstream Christians. It's a big subject, but I think there's a better interpretation. Check out Trinity's podcast 301 for a way to look at this introduction to the fourth gospel that fully takes into account its Jewish background and its first century context.
That's the traditional small-c Catholic view that he's summarizing here. In the Incarnation, the Son of God now has a human nature as well as a divine nature. This means that Jesus had everything about him that was truly human. But he was also at the same time fully divine. Both natures, both kinds of thing, were united in one person, the God-man Jesus Christ. So there he kind of splits the difference. Some theorists describe natures as properties, qualities, like essential attributes, so that human nature would be all those attributes you have to have to be a human, and divine nature is all the attributes a thing has to have to be a god. Then we'd be saying now that Jesus is a single self, a single person that has both of those attributes, all the divine attributes and all the attributes that are required for being human. Notice at the very end, though, he snuck in a different interpretation of the word nature, nature as a kind of thing. So another way in ancient philosophy about talking about a nature is that you're a human nature and I'm a human nature. A human nature would be a human being, an individual human. A divine nature would be a thing with divinity. It would be a god. And so another interpretation of this two natures kind of speculation is that within the one Christ, there are two different things. One of those things is a human nature and one is a divine nature. Now, is that saying that there is a man and a God there? There are some different tricky moves that a theorist can make here. If you want to see what some of those are, you can check out my interviews in podcasts 143 and 144 with Roman Catholic analytic theologian, Dr. Timothy Paul. Basically, he admits that there are two things there, but he thinks that because of the mysterious union, you can't refer to the human nature as a human person, but you can only call something a person if it's an ultimate subject of predication, and the ultimate subject of all the properties here is really the divine nature. So even though the human nature does things like feel thirst or love its mother or die on a cross, it's not to be referred to as a human person, because you should only say there's one person there and that's going to have to be the second eternal divine person of the Trinity. There's a lot of difficult speculation here being very quickly passed over, but I guess that's just what happens when you're trying to simplify a very difficult, convoluted tradition. Now, at the end of that segment, he used the word God-man. Just notice that the term God-man is not in Scripture, nor is the term God the Son nor is the term Trinity, nor is the term second person of the Trinity, nor is it even said clearly anywhere in the New Testament that Jesus has a divine nature and a human nature. It's all inferred according to traditional readings or maybe misreadings of actual biblical statements. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Our narrator tells us why, in his view, it's very important that our Savior be both human and divine. Okay, so in this last portion of the video, he's going to tell us why this is so very important that Jesus is both human and divine, or alternately that the one Christ consists of a divine nature together with a human nature. And here's why this is important. If Jesus isn't fully human, then he didn't come all the way down, and we can't get on the ladder. But if Jesus isn't fully divine, then he can't take us all the way back up to God. What? We can't climb the ladder. Why not? We can't get up there. But the amazing thing is this. In his great humility, Jesus went all the way from heaven down to earth, and he hit the ground with the thud and got dirt on him. (laughs) Not only did he become a human, (laughs) but he was born to lowly status. Jesus was a construction worker's son from a one-stoplight town in a tiny oppressed country at the edge of the Roman Empire. He grew up poor, worked with his hands, mixed with everyday folks. He ate, drank, laughed, cried, suffered, and died. He took on all that was truly human. 
There can be no clearer demonstration of God's love than this. God became a man. So now when we look to God, we can see in the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ, a real human being, staring back at us from the right hand of God the Father, beckoning us up the ladder. So this God-man theory, one problem with it is that it's not clearly taught in Scripture. And another problem with it is that it couldn't possibly be true. Now, I know that sounds like a bold statement, but it's very plausible that properties that are implied by being a man are incompatible with properties required by being a god. In my debate with Chris Date, which is online, and in my co-authored book, Is Jesus Human and Not Divine?, I explain how there are four such contradictions. Now, about this matter of atonement, here is what is a basic traditional Christian teaching. Jesus died as an atoning sacrifice for human sin. And the point of his death was that so we can be reconciled with God, so that we can be forgiven and have a new standing with God, and that we can be children with God. Now, quite exactly how this atoning process works is a matter of a lot of disagreement among traditional Christians, and it's the subject for a lot of speculation. What he does here is he just sticks with this ladder metaphor, and he says, the divine person doesn't come all the way down. It's like a little six-foot-tall ladder hanging off a cloud. It's not coming low enough to reach us. And also, if he's human but not also divine, how can he reach from earth all the way up to heaven? Honestly, he's pressing this metaphor too far. What he's trying to argue there is that somehow Jesus couldn't provide atonement unless he was both human and divine. There's a lot I could say about this, and for some discussion of atonement theories, you can check out Trinity's podcasts 196, 197, and 91 and 92. Or for a really basic introduction, check out podcast 37, Why Did Jesus Have to Suffer? But without going into dueling atonement theories, Let me just note that the New Testament nowhere says, assumes, implies, or hints that to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Jesus had to be God, or had to have a divine nature, or had to be divine in the way that the one God is divine. It is suggested, arguably, in Hebrews 2, that it was especially appropriate that our mediator and that this sacrifice should be human like us. That is suggested, but that he has to be divine. That's just people projecting later interests upon the New Testament texts. If God could accept in older times animal sacrifices, why couldn't God accept as the once and for all new sacrifice of the new covenant that just a perfect human being dies? God says, this is my beloved son. Presumably this was a very valuable sacrifice. God was losing something in a terrible way by allowing his son to be murdered by the Romans. If God thinks that's a valid sacrifice, if he thinks that's a valuable enough sacrifice, how can one argue with that and say, no, no, he would have to be God? Why? Look, he couldn't be God. We know that he's not God because he died. This is in my debate with Chris Date and in our co-authored book, Is Jesus Human and Not Divine? It's also on podcast 145, Tis Mystery All, The Immortal Dies. It's a New Testament teaching, and it's also a product of perfect being theology independently, that God is essentially immortal, which means that it's not possible for God to die. God is alive, and he can't not be alive. That looks like a quality that a perfect being would have to have. And moreover, God's essential immortality is implied by a couple of New Testament passages. See Podcast 145 for the details. So if you're essentially immortal, then it's just a contradiction to suppose that a being like that should die. But of course, we know that Jesus died, the one Son of God in the New Testament. He died on a cross. Okay, well, that's not God then. That's not God himself. Nor is it a being other than God who has divine nature, right? Because divine nature implies essential immortality. So that Jesus died for us, this wonderful fact is not compatible with Jesus being God, but it requires Jesus to be something less than God. Hmm, what could that be? Well, John 8.40, the New Testament has Jesus saying that he's a man who told you the truth that he heard from God. He's a man. Not just any old man, not just a, quote, great teacher. He's, according to the New Testament books, God's unique Messiah, which is a great and wonderful and unique thing. 
But according to the New Testament, this is a role or an office that can be carried out or occupied by a man. Of course, sent and empowered by God, guided by God during this whole process. Bottom line, Protestants supposedly take Scripture as their authority in doctrine, and all doctrines are to be derived from Scripture, and we're supposed to test any traditional doctrines to see if they're compatible with Scripture. And any theory on which God is the Trinity is not compatible with the one God just being the Father himself, which is the actual New Testament doctrine. If you want to see the basis for that, you can see the opening statement of my debate on the Trinity with Dr. Michael Brown. I'll put a link to that on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. And also I'll put a link to the blog post where I supply a written version of my opening statement. If you look at the scriptures there, you'll see that scripture speaks pretty clearly here. You can also check out podcast 189. Now, in the first six Christian centuries or so, as doctrine was developing in the small c Catholic bishop-led tradition, as different elements were getting added, there were always mainstream Christians who disagreed. And then finally, the Trinity was made mandatory in the year 381. You can see my book, What is the Trinity, for the basic historical details on that. Even at that time, yes, there were a lot of mainstream Christians who were not on board with this new triune God idea. But there was a really hardcore enforced conformity there. Since the Reformation, mainstream Christians have gone back to the Bible and said, hey, we should roll back some of these Roman Catholic traditions and go back to what Scripture teaches. And ever since that began, basically, some Protestants have said, hey, the Trinity and Incarnation doctrines as taught by Catholics, they're really not in the New Testament. The New Testament can be understood better without those doctrines. So I would humbly suggest that Protestants, including United Methodists, ought to be honest with their people and admit that there is a minority report in the Protestant tradition, which is just what I said, that it's the Unitarian view that the one God is the Father and Jesus is his human son not a second person within the Godhead or second eternal divine person, etc. We have to be honest to scripture, we have to be honest to history, and we shouldn't be teaching recent speculations as if these are things that Christians have always taught. The recent speculation here being that the one God is an eternal relationship between three divine persons. I mean, that just looks like tritheism, and the three gods always get along with one another perfectly. But scriptural theology is monotheistic, and more than that, it's not just that there's one God, which might turn out to be the Trinity, but no, there's one God, and it also tells you who the one God is. It's the Father Almighty. It's the God of Jesus. If you want to see how the New Testament authors sharply and constantly distinguish between Jesus and his God, you can check out podcast 257, which is called A Letter from the Lord Jesus About God and Me. So I hope that's helpful. If you're a new Christian, I'm very sorry that things are not as simple as the series of videos makes them out to be. But the good news is that New Testament theology does make sense. It is possible to sort your way through all these later speculations kind of clogging up our understanding of the New Testament. It is possible to go back and just agree with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul about who the one God is and who the Son of God is. Thanks for listening. This week's thinking music has been the track Ladies Take Me With You by Dr. Turtle. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. <laughs>
you love the Trinity's podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook. And help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode, or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities Podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Until next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.